Hi, Nico. Good to see you. Good, thanks. I'm really excited about this uh, workshop. Okay, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch break and are strengthened and refreshed for what one of the Twitters that went out, the tweets that went out today said, GACs are the best. So welcome to our general adversarial collaboration session number one. And what are GACs? So for those of you who attended the online CCNs, uh, you may be already familiar with the format. Uh, the idea here is basically, uh, you know, you bring different people with different viewpoints together in hope that together they find a new synthesis of ideas. So we can all benefit from talking to people who have different ideas and theories, and we're not just talking enough about them. And so what we want to do is to facilitate that with the GACs. So we have invited researchers to propose sessions. In our first session, we're going to learn more about in a few seconds. Uh, the idea is that they have different viewpoints, but a commitment to try to resolve their differences. The idea is that in this uh, sessions, they try to design and find a way forward, maybe even a good way to uh, separate and disambiguate the theories. And the idea is here that this is a respectful, friendly, and collaborative competition of ideas and how to work together. So why should you guys attend and not just these people in a small room? Well, first of all, it's a learning opportunity uh, for a lot of us, not just early career researchers, which is what ECR stands for, but for everyone else. It's about community engagement. Work out differences together, now more than ever more important. And the more contributions we get also from you, questions and so forth, the more we can all learn. And the idea is also simply that more brains bring also more diversity uh, and increase the number of solutions and ideas we can find. And the idea is that we want to provide a platform for these discussions to occur, not just as a fancy private dinner somewhere after a conference, but in an open space where we can all benefit uh, and learn from that experience. And the idea is that we have a transparent process where the GSC kick off, write position papers uh, where they suggest ways forward, and if you attend the evening sessions and some of the talk sessions, you will see some of the outputs of past GSCs uh, coming together. Good. And so with that, we come to our uh, GSC JC session one, how can we optimally use neuroscience data to guide the next generation of brain models of primate visual and linguistic cognition? And I'm going to step down now from here uh, and invite our two moderators to make themselves be shown. And that's Ko from York University, and he's just finished his postdoc at MIT, and Greta, who is the definition of an early career researcher and a third year PhD student at MIT. And so these two will guide you, will moderate the sessions, will pick up your questions, and I hope you truly, really enjoy this, because GACs are the best. Thanks. Cool. Can everyone hear us? Hear me? Okay, so um, you already know the title of this uh, session. How can we optimally use neuroscience data to guide uh, the next generation of brain models of primate visual and linguistic cognition, otherwise known as the GSC with the long title? You know? Um, okay, so um, let's make some points clear before we get started. So here's the team, and I'm Ko, Kohitich Kaur. So I recently joined as an assistant professor uh, at uh, Center for Vision Research at York University. I was a postdoc with Jim DiCarlo at MIT for the last six, six seven years. Um, so by neuroscience data, we mean uh, both neural and behavioral data. This is sometimes confusing. We just don't mean neural data. We also will mean behavioral data. Um, the idea is to guide, to, to, to guide the next generation of brain models. And we need to be a little bit more specific about what we mean by brain models. So the models need to be falsifiable. This is a premise that we should all agree on before you know, we, we, we move forward. So they need to be falsifiable. 
we, by which we kind of mean that they need to be computationally explicit, and, and it's just not like words. Uh, they need to accurately predict data. It can be beautiful and falsifiable, but if it does not predict any data, then at least for me, it becomes very uninteresting, and I think hopefully for most of the members of this GSE. Okay, uh, we will be talking about primate uh, visual and linguistic cognition, and because I have worked in vision for a long time, my introduction is gonna be flavored mostly by vision. Okay, so uh, here's a brief um, synopsis of, of how we usually go about our business. We have some hypotheses that we want to test. We design some experiments. We do these experiments. We analyze data. We collect and analyze data. Then we make some conclusion, and it goes back, and we update our hypothesis. Right? So I, I hope this is not contradict. Like, this is not arguable. This is kind of like very s simple. We, we all follow this. Now, a hypothesis have been improving over the course of time. Um, we initially had like hypotheses like, does a brain area respond to visual stimuli? We have moved beyond those kind of hypotheses, and it's like, oh, which artificial neural network better align with specific visual areas and behavior? So we have hypotheses that look like this now, right? So um, one quick note is that all of these hypotheses, at least many of them currently, are sort of a favor done to us by machine learning researchers. They're like coming from you know, the ML field the ones that are really you know, highly accurate and predicts everything. Just a note here. Um, the other thing that we do are experiments, and I'm gonna be very biasedly showing some experimental techniques that I have done, but there are obviously other experimental techniques. So it could have started from you know, just single electrode recordings and then gone on to, you know, we, we can now do uh, multi-electrode recordings, neuropixels and stuff, and of course uh, also optical imaging. So the experimental techniques are also developing. So there are kind of more complicated, more sophisticated hypotheses coming from uh, AI, let's say, and then neuroscientists are developing all kinds of techniques. The, the, the problem that we want to highlight or the thing that we want to really discuss in this GSC is what happens after that. So it's this loop, this, this idea of like, when you get the data, you, you want to update your model. What kind of updates do we usually do? What kind of updates should we do? And how do we think about this? So, um, so we, we have sort of like three approaches that we have proposed, and I will show you some results of polling internally from our GSE members of where they stand. But, but you can think of like one kind of update being, you know, like this qualitative experimental findings and add to domain knowledge. Like so, um, let, me, let me give you an example. So I will shamelessly plug in my own studies here, also because I don't want to offend anybody else if they did not, you know, really subscribe to one of these um, axes. So for example, we had a paper saying evidence that recurrent circuits are critical to ventral stream. So if, if you just say that, okay, recurrent, we have done some experiments and we have shown that recurrent circuits are important for some task. That, that is a compressed form of you know, inference. It's like we did some experiments and from here we know we need some kind of recurrence in the model. So feed forward not, models are not sufficient. But it's not really engaging with the data directly. It's just taking the data, compressing it into some inference and then asking the models, hey, modelers, build some recurrent models. Or like we in inactivated PFC and said, oh, PFC is part of this circuit. So the modelers should now include PFC as a part of their circuit. So these are what, at least in this definition, we are calling it, we're adding to domain knowledge and hope, hoping that you know, some kind of inductive bias or something will be um, used in the models to, to, to make sure that they, they, they listen to us. The second one is like directly, instead of comp uh, compressing this into like sort of these words, we will directly use the data to fit the models. So we create architectures that are recurrent and use data that fit directly to, this, to, this, uh, to these models. So here is an attempt from us. Uh, we also tried this. I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, so the third point is like don't do either of this. Like don't even bother with all this because neuroscience is in the dark ages. These models are going to make you s get stuck in a local minima. Don't, don't bother about updating these models. Just keep finding fundamental insights about how the brain works. And hopefully all of our speakers will touch on each of these points and where they stand and how they want to uh, address these uh, three points. The other, the other point, um, the other thing is that when we have developed some models, we want to then design experiments. This is the other axis of our adversarial uh, collaboration. So how do we go about designing experiments? So one can say, okay, now we have some, this, some of these ANN models, maybe too many of them. So we can uh, use these models to design experiments. And this is work that has been done by many folks. Um, 
also from Nico at Krieger Scottish Group, they have this controversial stimuli, which is so, sort of the idea is that you directly compare the models that are leading models and make them compete against each other and find stimuli that are you know, most discriminative amongst models and then use them to design you know, your tasks. So, so that's one approach. Again, you could think of this as like, you can criticize this by saying maybe you know, if you do that, then you're stuck with the models, whatever the limitations of those models are. You're never gonna get some more fundamental insight about anything else. So there, there comes a second axis, which is like experimental design should be driven by in experimenters' intuition about how to best make progress. So I'm just gonna pull it out of a hat and think, oh, think uh, read textbook and think about things in a basement or somewhere, and then I come up with the experiment and I do it. So that's the second sort of uh, axis in this. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a very quick uh, rundown of like how I have kind of addressed some of this in, in, in my previous work. So we in the lab, we had been addressing like how does the, we, we have been asking this question, how does the brain solve core object recognition? So as an experimenter, I had this sort of, I was telling you that we design experiments, so I have these two knobs. So one is the behavioral knob, I can run humans in, in Amazon Mechanical Turk or, or you know, in, in the lab. And we also have monkeys that do similar tasks as humans. So monkeys are doing this task in the, in the lab. We can, uh, because we can, monkeys and humans share uh, um, a lot of commonality in this uh, task and, and brain structure, so we can record in monkeys in different areas. You know, we can stick an electrode, we can record activity, we can perturb activity with different things. But at the end of the day, as I was saying, that you, the, the goal is to you, you go back to the loop and you update the hypothesis. So you start somewhere. So all things like progress, knowledge, mechanisms, understanding, sort of the answers to the question, how does the brain solve object recognition or core object recognition, it boils down to what kind of models do we have of the system. So we can start from models like HMAX or SIFT or you know, word models like brain area X does face processing, things like that. But at the end of the day, these models and these uh, has to explain, you know, this, this data that we are collecting from behavior. So based on some of this comparison, feed-forward models uh, were, uh, feed-forward convolutional network models kind of emerged as one of the winning models of, of explaining all of this data. And as I said, like the fundamental premise is that these models need to be falsifiable, they need to predict the data. So these, these models in fact do predict the data and they, they are even able to control neural population to some degree. So then one way to design experiment would be compare the models, and ask like what they can, what they cannot do. So in one of our studies, we did this. We um, compared two models. One was the model that was running in the monkey's head, and the other was the model that we had, the speed forward model. So we compared these two models, and we asked like, what images are the monkeys and the feed forward models doing exactly like each other, and in what image do they differ? So these red ones here, quickly, are the ones where the monkeys are outperforming uh, the feed forward models. So, so we get this sort of design of what to do as a neural experiment from this comparison, and we ask, like, maybe the monkey has something in its head that is more than what the neural, uh, current uh, uh, neural network models have. And, and, and when we did this experiment, uh, so we went into the monkey's IT cortex, and we, we recorded from there, and we basically found out that, okay, if you implant arrays, these red images evolve slightly slower. And we had did a lot of control experiments for this, but the idea was that maybe these red images are you know, getting, uh, sort of taking advantage of recurrent computations in, in the brain. So then fo following up, we did some other experiments with perturbing PFC, which is part of the recurrent circuit, blah, blah. So anyway, so these data, again, are kind of constraining our architecture. So this is the first mode, producing inductive biases. So we take these inductive biases, or we take this information, and we start building models. So we, start, we started with this Cornet model. There's other Conv RNN models that we and other, our, our collaborators have been building. So then again, we have been building this kind of model, so that's the update, so that's the inductive bias update. The other update that I was talking to you about was that you can take this data directly and then start training this, these models, these updated you know, models. So this is an attempt that we did. We had three, we take data, took data from three monkeys, we used the data of IT to directly train these models when they were also training on other tasks like ImageNet classification. So then, we fix these models and then we test them for three different things. So we get three other monkeys and they look at completely different images. So now this new model that was trained with three other monkeys and different images responses are gonna predict the responses of three held out monkeys, responses of human behavior real task, and we will also test how adversarially accurate they are. So this is kind of like 
I would say maybe the, the direction that we are kind of right, right now uh, going where we are kind of mixing the inductive bias approach and also directly feeding the data to, to um, th these, these plots are just to show that when you do that, uh, uh, the predictions improve. All right, um, so if you haven't looked at it already, so we tweeted, I tweeted in the morning, so if you, this is a good chance to uh, follow me on Twitter as well. Uh, if, <laughs> if you go on Twitter, the, the first post that is pinned are, is a, a, a form that we, we gave out to people, and some of these questions are mentioned, and you can give your answers. So we just wanted to know where the field stands when, you, when, I, when we ask some of these questions to, to all of you. So please go uh, on Twitter and look at this link. The, the Google form and, and tr please uh, s submit your answers. We will come, come back to that at the end of the GSC. So very quickly, you will see this uh, in front of all of our speakers' talks. Uh, but we asked this question to, to our speakers and members of our GSC. So this is sort of like a spread of like where they stand. Um, uh, so the axes are like, like 10 means like we really support direct fit uh, models to data. Here is like use domain knowledge or we are in the dark age. So we have a variance in this. It's not like everybody thinks that we have to directly fit the data or something. For example, experimental design, we still have variance in like, should it be ANN driven or should it be experimental intuition driven? So hopefully all of our speakers will tell us like where they stand and why they stand there. Uh, also, the other thing we were also thinking that there is a discussion about theory. So should we develop theory and then proceed or we develop theory um, side by side, hand in hand with all the experiments. Because I've heard it too many times, but I don't understand this sentence much that you know, neuroscience needs more theory. Um, I really don't understand what, what it means, but hopefully some of the speakers will throw light on it. Uh, I've never seen a use of theory in my um, ca academic career so far. Um, <laughs> anyway, so this is the, the, the list of speakers, and that's where we are, the green line, hopefully. So the next speaker will be Joel uh, Zilberberg from York University, and he will be connected to us via Zoom. So thank you all. Thanks for, ho hopefully this will be an enjoyable session for you. Thanks. Uh, perfect, I'll share my screen now. Um, so yeah, first of all, I, I just want to say that I love this format of this sort of GAC. I'm really excited to get to participate in this, I had desperately hoped to be able to make the trip to, to San Francisco and for like a host of reasons, um, had to, to cancel the trip at the last minute. So I'm glad I still got a chance to join you all in this, in this format. Um, and many, many thanks to Ko and Greta uh, for really pushing the organization of this. Um, I think it's, it's gonna be fun times and really appreciative of all their hard work. And now I'm gonna give one more uh, preface to my talk, which is I'm gonna make some uh, kind of strong, maybe a little bit controversial statements. And I mean those mostly in the spirit of stirring up this discussion. So if you, you know, profoundly disagree with the way I've characterized neuroscience, uh, please don't get offended, but instead, you know, uh, convince me otherwise and we can all move together uh, in that kind of spirit. Um, so the main claim um, that I wanna make here is that we should be thinking about making better brain-like models, so ones that can better predict brain activity, not just by directly training uh, neural nets on brain data or by finding the right tasks to train them on that lead them to be brain-like, but rather by defining architectures and unit types that are uh, brain-like. In other words, put in inductive biases from what we already know about the way neurons work, uh, which is a lot. We have a lot of knowledge about you know, neuronal biophysics uh, that we can really use to make these systems better. And so on these axes uh, that Co nicely defined, uh, this is where I stand. I sort of tried to highlight, you know, myself as this, this yellow uh, point. I think we should use a lot of domain knowledge. In other words, things we already know about how uh, neurons and parts of the nervous systems uh, work. And that, uh, for at least for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to argue that direct fits to model data aren't necessarily the way to make uh, the, the more brain-like models, but rather they're, in my opinion, the way to validate whether we have architectures that are suitable for making brain-like models at all. In other words, if your model cannot fit directly to brain data, then it certainly is the wrong architecture, and you can use that to winnow down the architectures. You can then train on other tasks in order to, to make brain-like models 
And by figuring out which tasks lead them to learn brain-like representations, uh, you can answer questions like what kinds of tasks uh, has evolution shaped the brain to be good at. Um, all right, so with, with that, I'm going to dive into to sort of the, the way I think about making brain-like models. Me and a, and a bunch of other people uh, put this paper out uh, a few years ago now, including a bunch of other participants um, in this workshop. And the main claims that we, we put forth in this paper are that to understand what brains do, we should ask about sort of this list of ingredients, the architectures, the objective functions, so what kind of uh, you know, tasks does the system need to do? What are the learning rules that optimize the neural network for those tasks? And then what kinds of training data are the system learned on? And if we find all the right set of ingredients, then we should be able to simulate systems that uh, learn to be very brain-like and as a result, we'll have identified the ingredients that are sort of key uh, to, to brain function. And in terms of architecture, I think a lot of the work in computational neuroscience has taken kind of off the shelf machine learning architectures, things like convolutional layers with ReLU uh, activations or maybe softmax. Acts. And we've trained those in different configurations or different depths, different widths of layers, um, et cetera. But I don't think we've done a good enough job yet as a field of asking whether we have the right unit types to put in those architectures. And again, that's, that's my main point, which is we should be thinking hard about putting in neuron-like unit types so that our networks have the inductive biases to already you know, push them to be, to be brain-like. Um, so uh, as I alluded to earlier, I think that you know, the way to use neural data uh, in this process is to use it as a litmus test for whether the architecture is appropriate. And then if it is, then we should go on and ask what kinds of tasks lead that architecture to learn uh, brain-like representations. So I'll start then by asking this question, is the architecture appropriate? And I'll do that in the context of the standard convolutional neural nets uh, followed by dense layers at the end with ReLU activations. And in this case, I've, I've put up a couple papers. This one on the left is from my lab. This one's from Surya Ganguly's lab. And in either case, we've just directly trained deep neural nets to take in um, stimuli and predict the vector of firing rates that was recorded when an animal was presented with those stimuli. Paper on the left, we did this in primary visual cortex. The paper on the right did this in retina. And in both cases, the conclusion is uh, yes, it works basically um, about as well as, as you might hope. You can predict pretty accurately what neurons will do on new stimuli after you've trained the neural nets on stimulus response pairs. So this suggests that the standard architectures are maybe not so bad, right? Convolutional neural nets with ReLUs. The catch to all this that I think is very underappreciated is that all of these kinds of analyses have been done under very, very carefully controlled experimental conditions. And I'll tell you more uh, about what I mean uh, by that in a moment. Um, and I made the claim possibly somewhat controversial, that under less controlled conditions, these types of models fail disastrously, and that that can be rescued by putting in more neuron-like unit types. So to, to make that point, I'm going to start by looking at the same kinds of you know, convolutional neural nets made out of ReLUs um, under slightly less ex controlled experimental conditions. We'll be doing this um, similar to that Ganguly paper that I showed you a moment ago, where we'll be taking in the stimuli uh, shown to monkey retina and trying to predict the responses of the retinal ganglion cells to that movie. And we're going to do this in a setting in which we have data from the same retina at three different light levels. So 30 R star, this is sort of like um, moonlight on a relatively cloudless night. So relatively uh, you know, dim, but you can still see. One log unit lower at three R stars, so three uh, rhodopsin, uh, channel rhodopsin isomerizations per rod per second. Um, so it's slightly dimmer, like when the clouds cover up the moon on that uh, moonlit night, and all the way down to 0 0.3 R star, which is even a little bit dimmer, uh, a little bit dimmer than that. And what we're going to do here is train our model to uh, based on data collected at these two light levels and just ask if we can then successfully predict neural responses to stimuli at this third light level. In other words, can we generalize outside of the conditions under which we, we started by training the model? 
Um, and to persuade you that these are not crazy variations, right? We've got two log units, so a factor of 100 change in light level um, between these, uh, these different stimuli. To persuade you that's not crazy, this is some data uh, from the lab of my collaborator, Greg Field, one of the, his technicians just grabbed an optical power meter, walked around the Duke University campus, and this plot shows you, you know, optical power uh, over time. And you notice that there are very frequent, you know, multi like factors of, of around 100 changes in the light intensity reaching this optical power meter. And that happens as, for example, you walk under the shadow of a tree or the shadow of a building. And so we very frequently uh, in our, our real world life experience these fast, big changes in light intensity uh, around a couple of log units. And this has been basically ignored in visual neuroscience experiments. We tend to always give very controlled, uh, controlled light levels. All right. So now when we uh, test our, or train our model on these two light levels, we can then test on held out stimuli from those same light levels and the model perform very, very well. This is the same kind of deep retina structure as the, the paper from the Ganguly lab. And when we test on the third level that was not part of the training set, the model is helpful. Um, you might think that we could rescue this just by doing better normalization. Like maybe we should normalize all the values in the input uh, to be between zero and one. We do something like that by adding a layer norm layer to the input. And even with layer norm at the input, the model still is awful when tested at a light level that it was not trained at. And the solution to all this, uh, and I promise go, I'm not going to run too long over. I'm, I'm getting close to done. The solution that we propose to all this is to put at the front end a photoreceptor layer. Um, we do this because we know the biophysics of photoreceptors have a lot of mechanisms that let them adapt to changing light levels. The specific model is this coupled differential equation model of the signaling cascade that turns a photoisomerization of opsin into electrical currents. We have this um, differential equation model that we've implemented as a trainable QRAS layer. So we can just dump it as the front end to our convolutional neural net. And then we can repeat the same experiment where we test at a new light level, in this, um, a lower light level than the two at which we had trained the neural net. And we see now, finally, we get um, reasonable generalization to the previously unseen light level. Still not perfect, um, but reasonable. And so that, that then brings me just to summarize my, uh, my main points, which is that I don't think we typically do a good enough job of probing how well our models captured brain function under less controlled real world conditions. Uh, and as a result, I think we are overestimating how well the standard ML models can describe brain function. Um, putting in neuron-like elements as our inductive biases, I think, can substantially uh, remedy this. Um, and uh, as a result, I think architectures that include those kinds of inductive biases, for example, a photoreceptor model that, that has luminance adaptation in it, is probably a, a key part to making uh, robust brain models. And I'll just end there. Uh, quick thanks to Saad Idris, who's the postdoc in my lab that's done a lot of this work, and to, to the collaborators down here on the right who contributed um, on the, the sort of the retina data side. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Uh, I'll take some questions. There's maybe time for a couple of questions. Someone has a question for Joel. Yeah. Hi, Joel, it's Aldo Faisal from London. Um, I have to contradict some of the things that you said to appreciate that you, you put them that way. So I think visual neuroscience, since you know, Laughlin's 1981 paper where they showed that photoreceptor transduction over multiple orders of magnitude is optimized to the natural statistics of, of contrast gain is one of the founding pieces of what we would call, you know, uh, thinking about sensory ecology and, you know, Infomax principles, papers that were out in the 90s and the 80s about these ideas, uh, all the way leading to Olshausen and Field and beyond to where we are now. So I think I wanted to moderate a bit what you're saying. I think the idea that we need to look at the real world, ecologically valid sensory stimuli is something that entire communities have been pursuing for quite some time. Um, I can see that if you're in a monkey lab in a very secluded, specific environment, People may have forgot that literature, but a lot of the things that we're thinking about now come from this early work. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Aldo. Yeah, it's a classic example of like a, a younger generation forgetting all the beautiful work of the past, or at least discounting it. And you're absolutely right. There's there's a lot of uh, really good neuroscience in that vein. I think my criticism is valid, though, in terms of the sort of neural network models of the visual system uh, sort of field that's really taken off over the past decade. I think we have collectively committed the sin that you described of um, discounting or not ad adequately making use of the nice insights of people like Simon Laughlin uh, and, and others that came before us. And I want to fix that by getting back to the kinds of things they had discovered and incorporating them. Uh, into our models. So, so the counter question for that is, to what extent the limitations that you're not capturing the, the natural statistics in your, in your predictive outputs, uh, does it come from not using the right training data versus not using the right quote, quote, model? Because one could argue if, the, if you have sufficiently general models, then, then it's simply poverty of the training data that, that drives your issue. Well, sort of, right? So if you have sufficiently general models and enough training data and a long enough training time, then you're probably fine, right? Deep neural nets are universal function approximators. So in principle, uh, sure, make the model really big, get enough data, train it long enough, and everything's fine. One of the lessons from the machine learning world, though, is that in practice, that's not how it works. If you make a really big, deep, dense net and try to use it to categorize image net images, even if you get uh, millions of those images and train your network for a long time, you're still going to do very poorly at uh, image net object categorization. If instead you put in the right inductive bias, in other words, make the things convolution and max pooling and put some skip connections, things like that, um, then you know performance becomes astronomically better. So it's not the case that we just need the right data and flexible models, there really is a benefit to having the right model structures. In other words, ones whose inductive biases align with uh, the task that they have to do. And because we want the task to be to look something like the brain, I think those inductive biases uh, should really come from what we already know about the function of the brain. Great, thank you. Thanks, Joel. We'll have a panel discussion at the end of this session, so uh, feel free to also ask questions to all the speakers at, at that time. So our next speaker is Kalanid Grill-Specter from Stanford University. So thank you so much, Greta for, and co, for organizing uh, this uh, GAC. And today I'm going to tell you about some work that's been ongoing uh, in, in my lab for several years now. And in particularly, I'd like to highlight the contribution of Eshed Margalit and Don Fincy, who are the first authors of the studies that I'm going to be presenting today and are also here in the audience. So I hope they can contribute to these discussions. So the GAC questions that uh, I'm going to address today is whether we could use neural data more efficiently for model building. And the one thing that our lab is particularly interested in is in the spatial topography of uh, representations in visual cortex. And as a field, we've known for several decades that neurons in the visual system aren't randomly organized. Uh, instead, the organization of neurons in, in the cortical sheet is very systematically uh, structured. For example, in early visual cortex, there are neurons that are tuned to particular features, such as orientation, and they form very regular and smooth orientation map on the cortical surface in V1. In high-level ventral temporal cortex, at the apex of the ventral stream, there are multiple maps for things like eccentricity or animacy, uh, or category, and in addition, we get clustering of neurons by their category uh, selectivity. And a question that really resonated with us in the GAC uh, proposal is the following uh, statement. For instance, we know a lot about specific functional topographies in visual processing areas, like the ones I've just shown you, but we have not yet implemented an image computable brain model with face patches. And the reason for that is that there are 
different classes of computational models that either try to model the topography or model the function. For example, if you look at early computational models, it was a discovery of orientation columns in V1. There's a lot of effort to try to explain the topography of V1. However, these models assume the selectivity of neurons in V1. They're very specific to V1. So while they can account for topographic properties of V1, they can't really account for topographic properties in any other visual areas or for the, any functional properties in any area whatsoever. More recently, a, a class a, of a new a deep convolutional neural networks has been really exciting for the field because when it's trained, for example, on a categorization task, these uh, uh, DCNNs are really good at predicting the responses of neurons across the entire ventral stream hierarchy. However, there's no topography in these uh, models, so they cannot explain any topographic property in any stage of the visual processing. So our goal is to close this gap and generate a new class of models that would explain both functional and topographic properties of visual cortex. And for brevity, I'm gonna fo focus on two areas, V1 and VTC, and on the most prominent um, properties, orientation tuning and category selectivity. So our goal is to create a computational model that reproduces both functional and topographic properties of visual cortex. And we want to use the spatial properties as a way to distinguish the most brain-like models. And if we can implement such a class of models, maybe that opens new opportunity uh, to ask new questions that would be otherwise impossible. So our starting point for these topographic DCNNs is to taking uh, off-the-shelf DCNN, maybe like ResNet 18, and then implement two changes. One change that we're going to implement is that for each uh, conv layer in this network, we're going to have a simulated cortical sheet, and units in that layer are going to be assigned a 2D position on the cortical sheet. The second thing that we're going to do is that we're going to change the loss function during training, and specifically we're going to add to it a spatial component that encourages nearby new neurons to have correlated responses, and we're gonna add the spatial loss function to maybe a standard task loss function. So just to give you a sense about the spatial loss function that we've implemented, suppose we have a set of uh, units on a simulated cortex, they have positions on this cortical sheet. We have during training, each unit has a, a, a vector of responses to the training images, and what we're trying to do is measure the correlation between uh, each pair of units. So this is the response similarity. We're gonna also measure their physical similarity, how close they are in cortex. And our loss function uh, is minimized when correlated neurons are actually sitting nearby on the cortical sheet. Now given that we're in the modeling business, there are many factors that might influence how well a model could fit the brain data. So we can manipulate several factors and see how they affect the goodness uh, of performance. One thing that we could manipulate is a loss function. Another thing that we can manipulate is how much spatial weighting. Of course, we can manipulate uh, the image data sets that we're training on. Uh, and so far, ESHA has trained 107 different topographic DCNNs with these parameters varying. Um, so, how do these topographic DCNNs do in explaining, uh, for example, V1? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do some uh, standard training, we're gonna use ImageNet, and we're gonna find the layer in our DCNN that best matches V1. In ResNet 18, it turned to be um, layer five, and we want to see if it, it replicates both the functional and topographic properties of V1. So, to, so after training to probe the uh, orientation tuning, we have a new set of Images, they are gradings in different orientations, spatial frequencies and colors, and we can measure the orientation tuning of each unit in this V1-like layer. And here are some examples are, of our V1 units, and you can see that they do have orientation tuning, so the functional properties of V1 uh, is emerging. So does it recover, recover also the topographic properties? So this is a simulated cortical sheet of V1 in our model, and here each unit in the model is colored by its orientation preference. And this is a particular network that was trained in the standard 
ImageNet and a categorization task with a spatial weighting of a half, and you can see that it generate really nice smooth orientation maps. So now we can uh, have a network that does that. If we try a different task, for example, a self-supervised task with SimClear with the same spatial weighting, we also get orientation tuning and we get smooth uh, orientation maps. However, if we train without any spatial loss functions, while we can reconstruct the functional properties like orientation tuning, we do not have a nice structured orientation map in V1. And just to have a control, uh, if we have a network that's untrained, we neither develop the right functional properties or the right topography uh, in V1. So the architecture itself is not sufficient to generate this kind of organization. So, so far we're doing pretty well on V1 in recovering both functional and topographic properties. What about ventral temporal uh, cortex? So if we look at after training uh, with ImageNet, what is the best uh, layer? It tends to be the highest layer. And in this case, I'm gonna show you uh, layer 17. So again, we want to recover to see if this network uh, is recovering the functional properties. And we can test that in two ways. One, we could use a brain score metric and see how well uh, our, our network predicts a, um, single unit responses in I, macaque IT cortex. And you can see that both of these networks, both a self-supervised network and a supervised uh, network are in a categorization task with the spatial weighting functions, similarly uh, and highly well predict as the neuron responses in IT. Another feature that we're interested in is category selectivity. So we can uh, run through our networks uh, 1,440 images from different categories and measure if there are units that, that show category selectivities. And indeed, we find units that are selective to faces or words or places for both a supervised and self-supervised network. So now let's see what kind of maps emerge on these uh, topographic DCNNs that have a spatial weight of 0.5. And what I'm gonna do now is show you the simulated cortical sheet of ventral temporal cortex, and I'm gonna color code the units by their preferred uh, category. So on the left, you can see the uh, categorization task, and here you can see the uh, self-supervised uh, task. And what's really interesting is that even though both models equally have the sim same functional properties and have category selectivity, and actually have the same spatial way weight, it's only the self-supervised uh, uh, training that actually generates face patches, place patches, word patches, and limb patches, whereas the supervised uh, model doesn't. Again, if we remove for the self-supervised uh, models the uh, spatial weight during training, we don't have uh, uh, the same clustering, even though we recover similar functional properties. So this is really interesting because it suggests that having a topographic DCNN might actually distinguish and or enable us to distinguish between different kinds of models that are functionally indistinguishable. And again, just to have a sanity control, if we have an untrained network, we don't have either function or a spatial topography in our network. So what we can do is we can sweep the spatial weights and see how the spatial weight affects the formation of the map. So this is a different alpha level of 0.25. This is a V1 lake uh, topography, and this is a VTC-like layer. And you can see that we also get clustering of both orientation and categories with this intermediate level. If we have zero uh, spatial weight or a very high spatial weight, the topography breaks down. And in fact, across both early and high level visual cortex, it seems that there is some sweet spot in between some intermediate range of alpha, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, that really reproduces both the function and topography in both early and late stages very well. So uh, this is very exciting because we now have a new class of models of topo uh, topographic deep CNNs that can recover both function and topography. So now we have a good brain-like model uh, can we use it to more strictly map model units to brain data and ask questions that would be otherwise impossible to ask? So a theoretical question for you, Ko, uh, that we might have is like, why do we have multiple functional st processing streams in the visual cortex? And the most common in theory that has been suggested is that different streams do different tasks. And an alternative hypothesis is that 
uh, maybe um, anatomical constraints actually generate these processing stream. And we can test this hypothesis by implementing the topographic DCNN uh, with a modification that the end stage is gonna model all these high level re regions across parietal, ventral, and lateral visual cortex. And now that we have a simulated cortex, we can map a unit in the simulated cortex to a voxel in the brain. And we're gonna do this uh, using the NSD experiment because the NSD experiment has lots of images and a lot of voxels. Uh, so what we're gonna do is after training the topographic DCNN, we can run through the entire uh, image sets that a participant had seen in the NSD experiment, for example, 10,000 images, and we can measure in each voxel in the brain or in high-level visual cortex the response to these 10,000 images and see which voxels match or are correlated with which units, and we can use an optimization algorithm to match a voxel to a brain unit. So this is direct matching. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna color the voxels, uh, the units in our simulated uh, sheet based on the stream that's their best matching. So we're gonna sweep the alpha level, and again, without any spatial map uh, uh, constraints, we do have voxels uh, um, assigned to all of the streams, but there's no kind of patchy structure. And as we increase alpha level, it's really interesting that at uh, some intermediate level, we see clear clustering by stream, so ventral, parietal, and lateral. And again, if we have too much of a spatial weight, this kind of structure breaks down. And finally, I'd like to make a point that actually uh, the training does matter. So when we have a self-supervised uh, DCNN, we really see the three stream uh, clustering, but when we have a supervised task, like a categorization task, we only get a really strong ventral uh, cluster, but no clustering for lateral or parietal uh, voxels. And the very, very final point that I'm gonna make is that not only that the models that replicate, the, the spatial weighting that generate the big, best topographic structure uh, um, are good brain-like models, but they're actually better correlated to voxel responses in the brain. And this is uh, both when we compare for a given uh, task across layers of alpha, or we compare between the self-supervised and the supervised task at the same level of um, spatial weighting. So to conclude, uh, we've developed a new class uh, of topographic uh, DCNNs, which is an image computable brain model that does generate face patches. And we believe that training DCNNs that in, in a way that balance task learning with local correlation not only produce brain-like topographies, but also allows us to distinguish between models. And we have this interesting finding that self-supervised training yields more brain-like topographies that mirrors higher level visual areas than a supervised category uh, training. And finally, we hope that this new class of models allows us to interface with neural data in new ways that were previously impossible. So thank you for your uh, attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, we can take one question, and then maybe also in the panel we can ask more questions. So, yeah. Go ahead, Carlos. That was, that was a really, really great talk. Um, I had a quick question, just uh, have you examined the selectivity of the units inside the actual patches to discover what might make them, I mean, are they acquiring individual specializations or is it possible that some of them are frivolous and mostly uh, duplicating each other's selectivity? Um, we, they, when we test the selectivity, we use an independent data set to images and then we have images 144 images from one of each of 10 categories, so 1,440 images. The different units might like different images, but they all look at, have similar, and they have some gradient of category selectivity. So one of the things that we've measured is like, how smooth is this transition? So you take two units on the simulated cortex and you increase the distance between them, and you can see that as you go away across cortex, the selectivity changes in a very systematic way. So they don't all have the same selectivity and the distance on the simulated cortex is reminiscent, is reminiscent of the distance in this functional mm -hmm. space. Thank you. Okay, and I'd be happy to take more questions in the, in the panel. 
Thanks, Colonel. So our next speaker is uh, J Jake Yates from UC Berkeley. All right. Um, okay. Thank you, Co and Greta, for putting this together. Uh, it's been fun so far. And I really like this slide and the questions we had to ask uh, because our answers are all over the place. And if anyone's interested, I am kind of on the edge. Am I not close enough? I'm kind of on the edge of the whole the whole crowd, which might make you think that I disagree with everybody. But actually, I think this is exactly what we want. And if we want to be optimally using neuroscience data to guide brain models, we should all kind of be pulling on our different directions with our own domain expertise. So add biophysics, add topography, whatever it is. The bigger question is really, how do we connect these dots so that I can use what Joel or Kalanick does? Um, and I want to take a zoom out and say um, uh, the big picture is that this is a really important question, and I'm happy we're not asking uh, or arguing about whether artificial neural networks are useful for studying the brain or making brain models. We're basically all using them. And the question of how we use neural data is kind of a broader one about how neuroscience can actually be useful for AI. Um, and I, th I just want to say that I think it's important that we think about how we're useful because uh, brain models are out there in the wild right now. And given this kind of close historic proximity between neuroscience and AI, it would be a shame if neuroscience wasn't actively useful um, in doing that because these models encounter edge cases all the time. Um, and when they do, the best case scenario is it makes a laughable video for TikTok. Um, so there's actually a potential for short-term health relevance in getting this right. Um, also, are we in the dark ages? I'd say mostly no, at least especially when it comes to brain models of vision, although you'll notice none of us so far have talked about high-level cognitive vision or linking to perception. Um, so when it comes to image formation and optics, we're definitely not in the dark ages. Same thing for photoreceptors, early visual pathway up through a lot of the ventral stream, not in the dark ages. Um, but when it comes to like getting at things like high-level um, cognition and consciousness, like it's very medieval. So the question again is how can we be useful with what we know for the people that are studying things at that high level? So I'm actually gonna go a bit meta here, which is that this isn't a question of specifically how to do it, but more a question of interoperability, which is basically how do we connect these different pieces together? There should be some way to link the next generation models. Um, and I'm gonna talk specifically about vision here. Uh, and I think um, for me, the way we should be using neural data is with these curated data sets. Um, for example, Kalanit trained on the neural scenes data set. I think that's, like, that's what we need to have more of. And they can come in the form of challenges, um, even though there's limitations to benchmarking. But overall, they should be in as natural conditions as possible. Um, and then all of the models, whatever model we end up with, should be deployable. And you'll note here I didn't use image computable. And I, I'll t talk about why I think we need to move beyond that as the common framework for, for models. So again, there are a number of these curated data sets now. We've got the sensorium challenge. It's got natural movies and mouse visual cortex. There's the neural scenes data set. Uh, and then there's brain score, which has been around for, for a few years now. And the, the question is, really I have is, uh, you know, why are these all on their own websites? Why isn't there a central way to find this? Um, how, how do I use what comes out of these? Like I've clicked through the BrainScore website you know, many times and I should be able to download the best model of V1 right now on images and I, it's not trivial. And this is in striking contrast to what's out there when you take a step outside of neuroscience where it's immediately obvious how to use models on say Hugging Face or Model Zoo. Um, and I realize there's all kinds of data access agreements and this is something that no one lab can do. But I think if we're all kind of collectively arguing and advocating for this, and there might be some support or buy-in down the line. Um, so um, the, the, the next step is really, um, how do we move towards, towards the next generation of vision models, brain models of vision? And it reminds me of this kind of early argument in the, like, the last 10 years of this revolution in object recognition, which is you need to have an, an, an image computable model, right? Models on the left are good, because those are image computable, we can actually run those on our experiments and test them. Models on the right that are like the kind of feature tuning models that neuroscientists have liked for a really long time, those are bad, right? And at first this argument seemed kind of nonsensical to me because of course the things on the right are actually made out of features that can be computed off of images, right? But in practice, the, the real point was, 
I can't use the model on the right, right? If I've run an experiment with, where I've showed images, I can actually run an image computable model on that. But someone has to implement the, the part of that model on the right that gets applied. So, um, and, and this, is, this has been, you know, hugely advantageous in the field of object recognition on images. Um, they've benefited massively from advances that are outside of neuroscience. And to borrow a figure from one of Coe's papers, right, where he was trying to develop the, you know, newer, better models of IT cortex, most of the models that he compares to weren't developed by a neuroscientist, right? So these end up being some of the best models of, you know, at least benchmark models. Um, so how do we replicate that feature more broadly for visual neuroscience, right? The ability to have basically a common framework for working with visual input so that it can be useful more broadly for people at high level vision or in vision models that are out in the world. Um, and so there, I think in the future, what's gonna happen, especially given like we're all pulling in different directions and that's exactly what we want, there will be many brain models. Um, and for vision, what is the, the form of that? Uh, and this is the point where as the only one of the people on the panel that's in an optometry department, I remind us all that the brain does not get images. Um, the outside world is not an image, and um, even though there are image forming optics, the retina is not a camera. Uh, importantly, even if you showed an image on a screen, uh, the eyes are constantly moving, even during fixation, and that drives dynamics that are in the retina. So the, the brain is actually getting a spatial temporal pattern of activity that's coming into it. So does it make any sense to compare architectures between something that's never getting this input um, in reality? So the, the question is, um, what is natural? Uh, for me, that's movies um, and with eye movements. And my lab takes this very seriously. We've pushed on developing high resolution eye tracking uh, in collaboration with Michele Rucci. Uh, and so we can measure the position of the eyes with much greater detail than we could before, uh, non-invasively. And then we collaborate with neurophysiologists to record from populations of, of neurons in monkey cortex in V1 primarily. And then my lab fits data-driven uh, artificial neural networks. These are not deep neural networks. They're, they're shallow, um, using all the most you know, recent advances in you know, machine learning frameworks, but with biologically constrained motifs. Um, and we were trying to do this at the highest resolution in the primate fovea, where we, we know relatively little about the circuits that process vision, even though they're important and you know, special for humans and primates. Um, and I don't wanna say much about this, except to say that you cannot measure a foveal receptive field uh, in primary visual cortex during fixation. Um, so on the left here is kind of the standard approach. You have a monkey fixate on a point, you show white noise, and then you reverse correlate by triggering on when the spikes happen to measure um, the spatiotemporal features that this neuron cares about in the noise. And you'll see that using standard fixation, uh, we get a very noisy mess there. But once we've corrected for the eye movements uh, during fixation, we get a clean kind of spatiotemporal feature that appears. And the thing on the right is that same, same neuron, but we've let the monkey look anywhere on the screen and we're correcting for it over a wide range. So we're trying to push to get towards more natural inputs for the brain. Um, and importantly, if you actually train one of these um, shallow you know, artificial neural networks to V1 and look at the model internals, a tremendous amount of the activity is driven by the dynamics of the input. And this of course can't be true if you pretend that the brain only got images where you would have to attribute all of those dynamics to something like recurrent activity when that really wasn't what was driving it. Um, I wanna say that the psychophysicists are clear on this point that if you stabilize an image on the retina, uh, people don't see it well. It's like taking two lines on the eye chart and a hit of performance, um, but of course, that's not true for, for um, images that are only flashed for 100 milliseconds. Um, and and it, is, it is true for um, high spatial frequencies and detailed images that are more like natural viewing. Um, so I think that the next generation of brain models of vision should be connected potentially through a common front end. Um, they should probably include time, and they should probably operate on luminance. And it's, I'm actually pleased to see that uh, Joel mentioned the same thing, is that we should actually have, we have good models of this. Um, they're just not readily available. 
Um, and they, they should probably have different levels of approximation. We probably don't need to always have a differential equation running with biophysics or model the optics through all the spectral you know, expansion that would occur. But in general, we should be able to download this at this point and run it and fit it into these models. And that can be the kind of common glue to connect across them. Um, and of course, I'm not doing this, right? I'm feeding the pixels directly into the spikes because that's what works right now. Um, uh, but it would be, but ideally, in the near future, we'd have some sort of kind of common framework. And um, and I think that yeah, it, it's funny that that Joel brought this up. But like, the the level of of um, ability to predict the response to the photoreceptors, we can't get the output of the retina completely yet. But we're we're a very far way towards having a model. The question is, how does everybody use it? How do we plug it in? Right, like right now, I can't use the models that Co's developing because they operate on images. But if there was a way to connect through the fact that these are all light-based, um, that would be ideal. So, um, right, I think the big question isn't we should all do specifically what we're experts at, um, and the question is one of interoperability and how we connect across those levels. Um, I think basically the most effective thing to do with neural data is release curated data sets that are ready for model fitting because that will drive rapid development uh, and common software frameworks so it's easy to connect and know where to find this stuff. Um, so um, on that note, if you are interested in any of this stuff, my lab just started at UC Berkeley and we are hiring at many levels. So feel free to check, get more information on this at my website, which is jake.vision and uh, or shoot me an email, but thanks. I think we have time for one question, then uh, the other questions can be moved to the panel. I actually ask you a question while uh, Sumi <laughs> is setting up. So uh, we have two eyes, right? And, and yeah. all these models have just one image. So there are so many different things that can be considered. Um, how do you prioritize them? Like, is there a guiding light, like for example, like some behavioral like prediction or some kind of other outer goal that could kind of motivate us, or what, what's your opinion? Right, I mean, I think that this is related to the question of like, if, uh, you like, in, in, in your work there is a task, object recognition, and you care primarily about the variance that is related to that. Um, and obviously, we don't want to build in every single level of detail that we know about. Uh, but I do think that the guiding principle should be like a, a multiple levels of approximation um, for this front end, right? This is how we're gonna connect these things. So it might be that, like, even for images, for example, they are emitting light, right? And that is what the brain is processing. And a lot of the edge cases that we run into with models that process images are related to gain control, right? That's not there in these neural networks. And presumably they could capture it, but we already know a lot about the system that does that. So I think the guiding principle is um, it doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't have to have all the details, but let's start doing it um, and try to connect through this because um, at any given moment I should be able to download whatever the state of the art retina model is uh, and, and I, can, I can apply that to one or two eyes, but at least like, that's far enough uh, at this point. So. So, so our next speaker is Suyan Chung from uh, New York University, and she'll be joining us virtually through Zoom. Great, thanks. Can you hear me fine? Okay, great. So yeah, thanks for inviting me to speak about this exciting topic. Um, so this is the, the adversarial axis, and uh, I just wanted to show you that this is where I stand on this topic, which is probably like, very much in the middle. Um, but what do I mean by that? And I'll just start to talk about that. So I think uh, what we're discussing is the picture of this, uh, how to use neural data to develop the next generation frame models. And what I'm hoping to convince you today is that the picture is not necessarily just this, but more like this, um, with a theory in the middle. And, and, and let me start with addressing some of the questions in the adversarial axis. So uh, one question there was um, experimental data should be used to directly train ANN models of brain activity and behavior. Uh, my answer as a theorist uh, um, is sure, but mathematical and theoretical investigations on interpreting these consequences um, of such endeavors should follow. Uh, so for example, 
uh, training the, uh, the networks with experimental data is not too different from a teacher-student framework, and there's a lot of well-developed quantitative theories for that. Uh, second question, uh, qualitative insights from previous and existing experimental results should be used to design in and models of brain activity. Uh, my answer is not yes or no, but an alternative, which is uh, the insights can definitely be quantitative. Um, and I think the quantitative insights from the theory from uh, current, previous, and existing experimental results should be used as an inductive bias. Another question, experimental design should be based on ANN network models that are predictive of a brain activity um, and behavior. Um, again, an, an alternative answer, sure, but um, I, I think the mathematical and theoretical investigations as opposed to qualitative just investigations should follow. The last question that I wanted to address is experimental design should be based on neuroscientist intuition that is derived from qualitative inferences generated by previous studies in the field. Now, here again, my answer is going to be uh, an, an alternative perspective with an additional dimension that uh, it's it's not uh, just uh, that binary. The experimental design can also be based on theoretical or computational neuroscientist intuitions that's based on quantitative inferences based on uh, generated by previous studies in the field, um, including uh, all these things, uh, but that, that are quantitative and also that can be at the population level. So, okay, so what do I mean by that? So let's go beyond the words. Um, I think we're talking about this because there are challenges with ANN models um, and using those as brain, brain uh, studying the brain, um, namely that uh, they have been very useful in predicting neural data, but in a lot of ways, it's quite hard to interpret them. Uh, but but in a, another sense, they're like fully transparent, uh, but and we have a lot of access, you know, uh, full access to what's going on inside. So then, like, what is the role of the theory, and what is the theory for? And my view is that a lot of the the questions around this uh, 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 the, the goal of the theory has to do with connecting multiple levels of abstraction in a quantitative manner, um, and you can define these um, artificial neural network models by the data architecture and learning rules. But uh, there's a lot of complex interactions in, in these networks that we don't quite understand. For example, the connections between individual features and the structure of their internal representations in each layer and how that contributes to the performance in the final layer after training. And I'm not sure if anybody has noticed, but this is very similar to the challenges we face in modern neuroscience with increasing access we have to many neurons that are recorded simultaneously. And that is um, how firing rates and in individual neurons and in, in their interactions give rise to representations and dynamics um, um, and collectively. And, and collectively, it gives rise to task performances. Um, so I think the task for theory is to formalize the relationship between these properties and phenomena at different levels uh, quantitatively. So, uh, and uh, this is where the theory of neural networks and statistical learning theory can be useful. Um, and here I'm just enumerating some examples of the effort in, in theory towards these goals um, in, in, in our field in general, but also in my lab. Uh, first, the theory of task efficient um, neural manifolds or representations. And, and again, uh, using the, the intuitions uh, from ge uh, geometry of uh, these representations to understand uh, ANN models and build better ANN models. And finally, um, also utilizing recent advances in mathematical theory of deep learning to understand the phenomena in ANNs quantitatively. So let me give a quick um, one simple example. So let's start with a simple example of an invariant object recognition which uh, refers to our ability to distinguish between objects with a lot of variabilities. And if you look at neural responses in high dimensional space uh, with the variabilities, it becomes a manifold of, of, a, of a dog rather than a, and a point of a dog. And if you have another object with stimulus variabilities, that becomes another manifold. Um, and and then and the, the, the kind of question that we can start to ask here is the problem of uh, a distinguishing between the two objects is equivalent to whether we can draw a hyperplane between these object manifolds and and, and we can start to ask the quantitative, quantitative question of whether we can use the neural geometry to quantify the separability of these objects. 
Now, um, it turns out there's already a very well-developed theory for linear classification of uh, 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 points called uh, the theory of perceptrons uh, from theoretical physics and computer science where uh, something uh, the, there's this notion of capacity of a perceptron that refers to the maximum number of points that can be linearly classified. Um, but this is uh, unfortunately about uh, discrete points and uh, it, it, uh, it, it's just uh, about a single instance of a memory. Um, so what we need for the complex problem of invariant object recognition is the linear classification theory of object manifolds. Um, and this is, a, this is a theory that we developed with Heinz and Polinsky and Van Lee, which is a theory of object manifold classification capacity. And this, this tells you the maximum critical number of object manifolds that you can discriminate per neuron. And um, I won't go into too many of the details, but I just wanted to give you a, a, a brief description of what, why, why, why I'm talking about this, because it's a quantitative theory that connects the multiple levels. So, um, so the first thing that pops out of a theory is a manifold capacity, which has to do with how many of these object manifolds you can pack into the neural state space in the neural data. And that has to do with the performance, um, uh, the discrimination performance. Uh, but then you can actually form formally connect it to the dimensionality, radius, and correlations, uh, either the geometrical properties of the neural data, which is a lower level um, property. So what that means is this, this theory of neural object manifolds can be used as a multi-level probe for neural population, where if you have a, a representation data with category labels, uh, then this method will compute the geometrical properties um, and predict the manifold capacity, which is a higher level. Um, and what this means is that this kind of uh, neural, neural population geometry framework can provide a mechanistic underpinning a quantitative mechanistic underpinning for task implementation and generate the population level hypothesis and scenarios. Um, and the other thing that I want to note is that this, uh, this neural manifold geometry is a consequence of uh, collective properties of single neurons. So by connecting the representation geometry with the performance or task, uh, we were one step closer to understand the role of individual neurons in, in task implementation. Um, and I just wanted to show that uh, using this uh, theoretical uh, framework, we actually have been uh, able to analyze the internal representations of many uh, ANN models that are known to predict the, the neural data well, uh, going from vision to addition to language, um, and also experimental data. Um, just wanted to uh, also show that, let me just uh, jump to the... Um, this slide uh, that uh, we can also use this theory to uh, to build models and uh, what we what we did in this uh, this endeavor uh, was uh, to to use the manifold capacity measure uh, as a loss function and uh, in, in, a, in a self supervised manner and it, it it's actually uh, uh, getting pretty the performance is getting up to pretty close to the state of the art. And there are many other exciting properties of the network that we're, we're, we're observing, it's, which is an ongoing work. Um, so to conclude, uh, I've just given an example of uh, where the theory can connect multiple levels of abstraction uh, via neural population geometry. And remember uh, that what we're doing with this, uh, the NNNs is just a test bed for, for questions in neuroscience. And hope I was uh, able to convince you that um, uh, that uh, focusing on representations um, in a theory of uh, neural networks um, can uh, can actually help us bridge the uh, the gap between uh, explicitly using neural data uh, to to train uh, neural nets, but 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 you know you can actually you know in, insert an understanding, but qu qualitative understanding of uh, of what's going on in the network. So. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, thank you for your attention and let me know if you have questions. So we can take a couple of questions and uh, the other speakers, Jake and Kalanit, if you could please come up for the panel.
Are there questions for Suyan? Oh, okay. Jake has a question. So, so um, my question probably comes from closer to where Co was, which is, how do we? Is is the end goal of having these these theor quantitative theories to get a better loss function, or uh, I mean, like, how do the, how do we link from it to a model that then? You know, Co and I can test on data, yeah, yeah, for yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I didn't have enough time to actually show you the results from the neural data. So you get so there's two ways in which this kind of uh, paradigm can frameworks can um, interact with neural data. One is explicitly using it to look at the neural data so that you can parse the um, the structure in high dimensional neural data with some set of numbers. Um, so then you, you know, then you're gaining an understanding about what's going on in, in neural data um, quantitatively, but you can also use those um, uh, uh, understanding with, with the uh, summarize that set of numbers. Uh, and then the other is uh, we, we were using the manifold theory to train um, a deep net and it was self-supervised learning that was performing really well. And the, the, you know, the next set of questions is, uh, that, that we're going to ask is, is this a good model of the brain? Does, does, it, does it actually have a good fit um, for, um, for the neural data? And we're already starting to observe uh, properties like they are adversarially robust without being explicitly adversarially trained. And um, you know, these are, these are brain-like properties. Uh, so I guess the, 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 I think it's very much similar to what the, um, um, uh, you know, I, I think the end goal and the direction is very similar to uh, uh, what, where Co is. Uh, but what, what I'm inserting here is that there is actually a low dimensional space of understanding with numbers in it. You can, you know, you can you can quantify things, and it's um, you, and, and 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 we don't have to bypass that. That's what I'm trying to say. Thanks, Suya. So. Uh, in the panel discussion, I think there are two options. One um, is that the speakers can get to ask questions to each other, because I think Kalanit and Jacob, you're, Jake, you're kind of not really in the same distribution, it looks like. Or, no, I'm off the, yeah, yeah. Like I'm um, off the And edge, also yeah. the audience should feel free to ask any questions. And even if you have suggestions of like, you know, just comment if it's, the, is, was this a good topic to even discuss? Maybe you can have some, you know, provocative uh, statements that way as well. So it's pretty much open-ended. So. Feel free to ask questions, or if you wanted to ask some question to Kalanita or Jake during the talk that you didn't get to ask, you can also ask those questions. Okay, I'll, I'll start with a very simple question. Um, if I understood correctly, except for one slide that I've seen so far, all the talks so far presume that in your modeling, you're imposing a task where you have a supervised learning model, learning the model. Is that correct? Is it not? So. No. So the, actually, what we've shown is that in order to explain topography, it's a self-supervised algorithm that would actually generate the topography. Because when we have a very strong task constraint, like a categorization task, it really kind of competes with a spatial loss, and that makes it really hard for it to generate the structure. So I would need to disagree with your assertion. OK, good. Th then I'm happy. So you must have presented something that looked like an autoencoder. I must have missed it. But what about the others? Yeah, I think uh, Joel and I were, were training supervised models, uh, but they were supervised to uh, spiking data. So they, they weren't doing a task. The task was to predict neural activity. Uh, My, but it is, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so can, can, can I make a general critique then? So if, if we're trying to understand the visual system, it's probably doing more than generating a representation for itself, and it's probably doing more than recognizing just objects, perception, behavior, and so forth. And if we take an evolutionary argument, you know, fitness comes out of behavior. So behavior should be our the ultimate driver. So I wanted to, to challenge the, the, the panel a bit. Um, shouldn't we ultimately think about models that generate actual behavior and then see whether they generate appropriate uh, inter intermediate representations? And what kind of behavior? Because is not recognizing an object a behavior? I mean, in, in one case, you can pick a task. No, that, so. That's not really driving your evolutionary fitness in the landscape, right? 
So I'm thinking more of a re reinforcement learning type model where you have something that does actually something meaningful in the world. And, you know, I'm talking about reinforcement learning that generates actions, and then you need a representation that feeds that state space in, in such a behavioral model. Uh, I would say that that's a formidable, like, that, that's, that's a reasonable proposal. I think generally when you end up trying to train those models and look at their performance in predicting whatever neural data we have, it, for in my experience, it hasn't been so good. So, uh, but but the other point also that I want to make is that at the end of the day, we are trying to test an inference model. We are not testing how it learned or or it. So, just making these two points separate. So we are always testing like the end point of the model. So whether it came from supervised learning or, or unsupervised learning or, or or you know reinforcement learning, it doesn't almost depend. It doesn't even depend on that unless you are actually you actually think that all these models trained on different pathways will not converge to the same thing, like it will produce different predictions, in yeah. which case the predictions should be the you know, judging point. But I don't know if I'm answering I want to quickly echo that, which is that I, I, I agree, that would be a great model to have. Um, but right now, how do we actually test it against neural data at the resolution that matters? Most of the, the reinforcement learning you know, agents navigating environments aren't navigating things at the resolution that matters for, say, primate vision. Um, so I think what we've mostly been focused on here is this kind of how do we falsify models, what's the right level of resolution, they should predict neural activity well is the, is the stance. So. Thank you. I can, would can, like can I, go ahead. Sorry, you, you go ahead, Joel. Yeah, I just want to add something small to that, which is I, I agree with you, Aldo. I think having you know, real behavior is important because there are features that need to be extracted to behave intelligently in the world, like object affordances. Can I pick this up? Can I step there? Will this thing be edible? Um, and those are not necessarily having to be extracted if you're just doing like core object recognition, return me a label of whether this is a fish or a dog or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, moving into behavior gets us there. Uh, to Jacob's point, or to Jake's point, it's true that, that we won't necessarily be able to, you know, experiment uh, and get neural data in as rich a setting as we'd want to evaluate these models, but, a model trained NRL with reinforcement learning that actually do some important tasks can then be tested in an experimental setting that mimics the same, you know, relatively impoverished and limited experimental setting in which we put the monkeys. Um, and so it's not the case that the evaluation of brain similarity needs to be done in the same rich setting as the training. We have next question from Dado. Thanks, everyone. This has been really fun. Um, my question, I guess, is mostly geared towards the organizers, but I'm curious to hear everybody's thoughts. So the idea of insights from textbooks has been sort of dismissed, it seems like, and I'm curious why. Is that because you think we've taken all that we can from those insights and they're already in our models? Or because you think that those are like folk psychology terms that we shouldn't care about? Um, and I guess if the latter, I would say that like a lot of those insights are already in the models, right? Like hierarchy, convolution. And another approach would be to look for that next set of insights that we can then implement in, you know, image computable models and compare quantitative, quantitatively to neural data. So I'm curious to hear everybody's thoughts on that. As one of the organizers, I, I don't think it was like, uh, we, we, we played it down or something. I, I think it was, mentioned as a like domain knowledge, like I think what, what mm -hmm. can it be called? So I think we called it textbook knowledge. But I, as I even showed in my talk, like we are generating those kind of domain knowledge all the time. Um, the main question was that if there is another axis of, of progress, maybe it's like beyond, going just beyond those kind of like compressed forms of, of, of inference to like maybe, because that's almost depends on the experimenter. Like we, we look at the data and we say, okay, this is what we need. But maybe the data has more to offer than, than that compressed form of, uh, of knowledge. I think that was the, the point, but I don't think one or the other is like the answer. At least maybe others can correct me. I think the goal is to take things like, you know, in the field of face recognition or something like holistic face recognition. That's like how you'd write in a textbook. And the idea is that can we turn it into some mathematical formula that we can operationalize? So I don't think we're trying to dismiss this. I think we're trying to actually operationalize this in a mathematical way. That's a great way of putting it. Thanks, Kalani. But I think that's different than what Ko's saying. Is that right, Ko? 
I mean, so one idea is to operationalize the insights we have, and another is to just let the data speak for itself. Yeah, but I, I think it would be kind of um, not okay to just do the, you know, let the data speak version, because it might be inefficient in some sense. At least that has been sort of the reason why we even have this kind of compressed, why people are looking for AN and interpretability. Otherwise, we might not have even looked for it. Because I think underlying there is an idea that if we understood the causal nature of things, maybe we can make more, you know, uh, uh, smarter changes to the models to update them. But so I think both should go hand in hand. Yeah. Thanks. Um, maybe from that side. Yeah. Hi. Um, it seems like a lot of the times when you're predicting to neural data, it's only to one form of neural data, for example, just fMRI or just spiking data, et cetera. I'm wondering if there's some information lost by not combining multiple types of data and seeing, for example, maybe the model is good at predicting spiking data, but it's not good at predicting fMRI data, and if you have to combine multiple forms of data to get a more holistic understanding. Um, can I speak briefly to that? Sure, of course, so, for anyone. So. Yeah, sure. So um, yes, right. I think any model that's going to have the right architecture to really form a good brain, a good description of the brain, uh, one way to test whether it is an appropriate architecture is to check whether it is capable of being trained to predict every possible modality of brain data. If it cannot. If there's any modality of brain data that the model cannot be trained to accurately predict, then there's something wrong with that model and the architecture needs to be revised until a suitable one has been found. And then once that architecture search project is complete and we have architectures that could predict every modality of brain data, uh, then you know we can find the tasks and learning rules and whatever that make, make <laughs> them learn to be brain-like. So one small thing, I don't know if we can see the chat, Seems like there's a lot of messages in the chat. Yeah, but it's from just from the speakers, so oh, okay. <laughs> they're really interested in this topic. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so I, I think that's a great it's a great question, but like, how do I use it? Right, this is the problem. Someone develops another model, and I can't like if I can't download it and use it in my experiment, then I can't compare across it. Right, so like that's why it's all well and good if everybody does you know, whatever they want to do and find what architecture works for their experiment. But I, I think that unless someone actually implements it, then then we can't, so. But we can do some somewhat towards that though, Jake, by, you know, sharing code in uh, formats that are interoperable. So like the retina, trainable retina models I described, you can go to Saad's GitHub page that I posted in chat, download those, uh, there's like both the complicated retina model and a simpler one, put them into any CNN you want, train them, end to end. So I think we can address that problem. We just need to like be friendly and share. Um, yeah, I think this is the problem is we actually agree too much on this. <laughs> okay, I, the organizers ask us to be more pro pro adversarial. So I'm just gonna make a provocative statement just yes, to get please. it going. So uh, I, I'm gonna say that I think like representation are overrated. So that's kind of my provocation. And the reason I'm gonna say that is like, a lot of the AI is about like finding the right representation, but we've actually shown that like with many different training regimes, you can get to a very similar functional representation and really what makes it, uh, um, what you can really use to distinguish the brain and the models is actually the implementation that they represent the topography. So you might wonder why we care about topography in the first place. So, like, if you had infinite resources like the Google Cloud, sure, you can write an endless neural network train for billions of parameters and, and fine. But if you have an organism that needs to feed itself, uh, it needs to be energy efficient. So kind of one of the things that's driving us is thinking about the implementation and having a very organized system is always harder than having a disorganized system. And the fact that this organization is maintained across species, you ask across species, that makes it interesting. So it suggests to us that the brain is supposed is optimizing something. And if we'd actually uncover what's it optimizing and what kind of learning rules will help that process, that makes it a really deep insight in my opinion that cannot just be generated by training on another task or trying to think about what is the right task uh, to train. So 
I kind of want you guys to think about implementation and, and not just about representation. All right, I'll bite, I'll, I'll disagree. Um, so, <laughs> uh, do you think there's gonna be one brain model of visual cognition or many brain models? And if there's many brain models, uh, they might need to accomplish something specific. And in that case, why do we care about topography if it's say two recognized images or something I like actually that? think that it's gonna be determined by the evolutionary pressures of different species. So some of you like to study mice maybe, and some of you like me like to study human beings. You like to study the retina, the retina is very different in the mouse than the human being. It doesn't have a phobia, for example, and basically the tasks that it needs to solve are different. So the, this is all about implementation and ecological uh, pressure. Uh, pr presumably the, the mouse retina does a good job for mouse tasks, right? But, um, and, and in that case, if you defined your task, which is you know being a mouse, right, it would be a, it would be a very good well, this is a test that we invented, like you learned to read, I presume, right? Yeah. Uh, you can definitely write. Uh, uh, this is a test that we invented, right? It wasn't like determined over evolution. Right, but it's useful. If, like a mouse can't read, so I mean, it might not be useful in studying the mouse brain if you were interested in reading, right? But like, if you want an, a brain model to do something, right, th that level of implementation might not matter, right, for that task. Uh, we can take one more question. Uh, by the way, uh, Suyan uh, and Ev, who are also joining us from the uh, Zoom, please uh, feel free to uh, chime in. Also, Alona um, and Nico. Um, um, by the way, at 3 p.m., we have a break, but we can continue the, the chat if the speakers are okay continuing, and then we can have, an, you know, those who want a break can take a break. So, question. Yes, I have like a question. This is coming more from a psychology background where you would do in, in human, like vision experiments. With also be really interested when the model or like the visual system goes wrong in, in terms of visual illusions and all of those things. And I was just wondering if it's actually in the scope to work with those perceptions in those brain models to kind of prove them or test them against potential visual illusions. And I mean, there's like also really early level illusions like uh, lateral inhibition processes or any something like this. I was just wondering what your opinion on this is. I think this would be really cool, right? So that's kind of a way of distinguishing between models is generating examples that would confuse humans but not a network or confuse a network and not humans. And I think that would be great if we actually get the neural, neural networks. I think you had it on one of your slides to generate the perception that would be more human-like and uh, illusions would be a good way to do this. People have done things like invariances like line drawings or generalization, but there's a really big range of illusion that might be interesting to try. Uh, 